Good afternoon and welcome to our Universal Design for Learning core concept webinar. This is webinar one in a four part series that we're bringing to you um, as part of some support for special populations and career and technical education across Illinois. A couple of housekeeping items before we get started. Um, good afternoon, my name is Amy Julian. I'm the director for the Illinois Center for Specialized Professional Support here at Illinois State University. With us today are our presenters, Melissa and Amanda, and they are both from CAST, which is the uh, Center for Advanced Special Technologies. And they are the individuals, I know if you've ever heard me say, they wrote the book on universal design. So they are our national experts on universal design. A couple housekeeping items, all attendees are currently in listen only mode. We do have opportunities for participation. If you would like to be heard, you can raise your hand and if your mic is working, we will happily unmute you. If you have questions, go ahead and post those in the question box. And if you are having issues with your audio, there's a little gear up there that you can click on and get the um, information to call in. So we wanna be sure everybody is able to hear and see. And um, CAST has enabled the closed captioning, so that is on with us as well. Again, I'm gonna go ahead and let us get started now. I'm gonna hand the floor over to Melissa. So thank you both for being here with us. And um, we look forward to not only the webinar, but the whole series on universal design. Yes, thank you. Thank you so much, Amy. And um, we're just happy to be here. We're happy to be with you and be discussing UDL, one of our favorite topics. If you would like to go to the bit.ly that is on the screen, you just type in that bit.ly and you will have a copy of our slides. It'll be in view only, but you could always make a copy for yourself if you want to take notes or keep it for later. Um, one note about the bit.ly is it's capital C-A-S-T, lowercase U-D-L, and then capital I-L. When I created it, it didn't quite look exactly the same, but right now it looks like there's two L's in a row, but that second is a capital I. So take a minute and get to that bit.ly, and um, Amanda, I'll put it in the chat so that it stays as I advance the slides. We wanted to let you know a little bit about ourselves. So my, again, my name is Melissa Sanjay. I work at CAST. I've been working at CAST for about two years as an implementation specialist. So what I do is I go to schools um, primarily throughout New Hampshire because we have a statewide contract with New Hampshire, but also throughout the nation and help them implement UDL in their classrooms, in their districts, in their states, and the size of the group we work with is different depending on um, where we're going. Prior to that, I was a teacher, a social worker, and a principal in alternative high schools. So um, I come to this UDL world with this passion for including those students that weren't, were not traditionally successful in their uh, traditional school environments um, because those are the kids I worked with for about 20 years. And I'll let Amanda introduce herself. Hi everybody, I um, added the bit.ly to the chat and also um, Melissa's email and my own email, just in case you wanna reach out and get in contact with us. So I'm Amanda Bastoni, I come to UDL uh, and teaching kind of a uh, long route, So I, but I won't tell you the whole story now. <laughs> so I was a CTE teacher and um, then I was a CTE director in New Hampshire. And then I got my doctorate in education. And while I was getting my doctorate, learned about UDL and uh, fell in love and wanted to be a part of Planet UDL. That's what I call it, this place where people design for everyone. And um, I think it's incredibly useful for CTE. And I'm excited that the fourth webinar in our series will really be focusing on CTE. That's great. Thank you, Amanda. And we'll tell you about that series in a minute. First, we wanted to get you sort of familiar with the, um, we, it's called chat box on our screen, but we realize it's called question box. We tend to use Zoom. Um, so if you wanna just test out that question box, just put in what role do you teach? Um, how well do you, and then put a number for how well do you know UDL from one to four? So one would be not at all, two somewhat, three maybe you had a training or two, and four you could write the book, on UDL, you can come join us at CAS and be one of our authors. So just type in the chat and let us know um, kind of where you're at and how you're coming to this conversation about UDL. Uh, we just like to make things a little interactive. We're gonna try to take some questions. Um, if we had it, if Amanda and I had it our way, we'd open all the cameras and be able to see all 100 faces. So um, we're trying to be as interactive as possible in this, in this format. 
and Amanda's going to track those and maybe uh, kind of summarize those as we go along. But we kind of have a packed agenda, so I'm going to kind of move into our content. Does that sound good, Amanda? Yeah, it sounds great. We've got some great responses already, Melissa. So um, some ESL teachers um, and some people who are, you know, really interested in learning more about UDL. They're sort of at one, some ones and twos I see here. Awesome. Great. So we're all starting at a similar spot. So the first thing we, used, we usually put up when we talk about um, UDL is our definition. So our working definition for CAST is universal design for learning is an approach to improve and optimize teaching and learning for all by setting clear and rigorous goals, anticipating barriers, and proactively designing to minimize those barriers. And that particular process is what we call the UDL design process, and we'll be going over that in our next webinar. But we continue, we continue to come back to this definition. And every time we see this definition of UDL, uh, the hope is that maybe we'll get a little bit more out of it and we'll understand it a little more deeply and we'll be able to reflect upon it. Another thing we often do in our webinars and our face-to-face -face meetings is we talk about our learning environment because that's a big part about, of UDL is how do we set up our learning environment so that everyone can be successful. So in this webinar, your options for self-regulation are whatever you have available in your space so you can sit anywhere you can take you can walk around with your computer you can eat at any time you can grab fidgets i i've been today fidgeting with this like broken piece of ottoman i have on my desk i'm not sure why but anything you have that'll kind of keep you focused and with us in terms of perception our options are you can watch the screen where we have the the shared the shared slideshow you can make that personal copy of the slides that i talked about some people will make a personal copy and they'll take notes in the speaker notes you can do that um, we have the captions up and available for you as an option for perception and then in terms of where you can act you can doodle you can raise your hand you could go to that question box and ask us questions so those are our options for how we can be in this environment so that's our learning environment for today and this this webinar is the first in a series so we're going to start with today the UDL core concepts and what what is the underpinnings why do, why UDL why do we do it anyway so sometimes we call it the why then on Friday which is May 8th we'll talk about that design process and we'll look at UDL in practice so now that we kind of know what the underpinnings are for UDL how do I use it what do I how do I how do I start and what might that look like if I saw it in a classroom or in practice. Webinar three, which will be May 13th, which is a week from today, we'll talk about UDL in a virtual environment. And Amanda and I have been doing a lot of work with New Hampshire around how do we get geared up remotely and what does UDL, how does UDL inform how we can work with our students remotely and what has become even more clear to us about UDL as we do that virtual environment. And then the last webinar, um, Amanda will be leading us in a UDL and CTE webinar, and that will be on May 15th, which is a week from Friday. So we hope that you can join us for all of these webinars. Um, if you need to plug in and plug out, uh, we'll try to make sure that we get everybody on the same page as to where we are as we start each of the webinars. So our goals for today, um, what we're going to go over in the next 50-ish minutes, is we're going to try to come to the realization to show that the barrier is in the environment, not the learner. We're going to explore the concept and implica implications of variability. And then we're gonna to try to develop a foundational understanding for the structure and the design of the guidelines. And if you'll see here on the bottom, this where it says representation and practice and engagement and practice. We put those on our slides because we're trying to model UDL as we teach about UDL, and we want to do that meta piece where we say, okay, so we put our goals up here because we want to guide appropriate goal setting, and that's in our representation principle, and we want to heighten the salience of goals and objectives. We do that because we know our brains are goal-directed. So once you set your intention, set your intention for your goal, it's going to have your brain it's going to have your brain to tell your brain to pay attention to certain things so that you can bring in the information that you need to achieve that goal. So I'm just going to pause for maybe 30 seconds and give you a chance to write on a sticky note or write um, if you want to put it in the question box. What are your goals for today? Given these are the, the learning goals, what are your personal goals for today?
Oh, Amanda, you're muted. Are you trying to talk? <laughs> yeah, sorry, we have a varied group with us. I just thought I'd take a minute and say we have folks from, you know, that teach ESL, human resources, administrators, adjunct faculty, science teachers, directors of PD, and people who do teacher training. So I just wanted to, wow. I'm trying to quickly welcome everyone, but just wanted to say we're really excited to have this diverse group. Yeah, that is great. All right, so hopefully we have uh, sort of set our intentions, told our neurosystems what to pay attention to, and we can dive into the UDL core concepts. So we have three UDL core concepts, and that's what, as I said, we call the why. And we get each of these core concepts from particular areas. So the first core concept comes from architecture. And when we start thinking about UDL, uh, universal design and architecture, we kind of head to that story of Ron Mace. Ron Mace was the father of universal design and architecture. And when he was young, I think he was around 10, he contracted polio. And because of that, he used a wheelchair for the rest of his life. His parents were told that they should institutionalize him, but they decided not to do that and they sent him to public school. But because of the way the public schools were constructed at the time, sometimes his mother had to carry him up and down, especially in high school, up and down the, the stairwells to get to classes. And as he reached the end of his high school career, he decided he wanted to go into um, architecture. So he approached a dean of an architecture school. The dean looked at him and said, you know what, I don't think this place is for you. I don't think you should try this. Um, but he didn't listen, so he went ahead and he applied to architecture school. And when he got to architecture school, he got in. And when he got there, the dorms were not accessible. So he had to build a specialized wheelchair that would go in and out of those bathrooms in the dorms or in the, in the rooms, but he couldn't even get into some of the dorms. So his mom bought a trailer and put, it, put the trailer outside the dorm. And she, she and he stayed there while he went to architecture school. So at the end of all of this experience, he decided that he wanted to have an approach to design that works for products, buildings, and can be used by anyone, regardless of their ability or disability, so that this experience is what helped him come up with the, um, the concept of universal design and architecture. So when we talk about universal design and architecture, sometimes it's helpful to think about what it's not. So what architecture is, what universal design is not is it's not retrofitting, and sometimes we see retrofitting. So if you look at this image, you can see here, this is a school, I believe in Boston, and this um, sign right here is at the top of those stairs. So you have to, first of all, at least get up to the top of those stairs to read that sign. And it says, disabled person's entrance is at the rear of the building. And then at the rear of the building, you see this somewhat rickety uh, ramp for access. So the consequence of this is not only do some people may not even have access to the building because they don't have someone to go up to the top to even read that, that sign, but also it's, it's sending a message that people that are not able to access in a certain way have to go a different route and have a somewhat substandard experience of entering into the building and they might not even reach the goal if they would be at the back of the building instead of the front of the building. This, so when we think about what is universal design and architecture, what is it? It looks more like this, it looks more like this image. So we have these stairs, we have these ramps, we have these handrails, and all of those things are um, available to us. And the goal is to get to the top, to get to the top, but you, may, you have many different routes to the goal to get to the top. So sometimes we think about who might use those stairs, who might use those, those, um, those ramps, other than someone in a wheelchair. Might it be a skateboarder? Might it be um, somebody with a baby carriage? Might someone have a different goal depending on when they experience this particular design? Maybe one day they wanna work on exercise, so they'll take the stairs. Maybe another day they wanna work, they want ease. Ease is their goal to get to the top. And so they, they're gonna take the ramps because that may be easier for them. So depending on what your goal is, will determine what the route is to the uh, ultimate goal of getting to the top of that, of that um, structure. 
So there's many other things that are also um, like this, and we get that core concept necessary for good, some for all. And I'm gonna kick it to Amanda a little bit to talk about um, her experience of some of these assistive technologies that are built for one thing, but people use them for other things. Oh, you're muted again. Sorry guys, I do mostly Zoom meetings, so I'm, I know where the mute is on Zoom, but this is a little bit new, so I apologize. Um, thank you so much, Melissa. You did a, you're doing a great job, as always, explaining UDL. I think it's important when we think about universal design for learning to think about the truth of how when we often when we design for um, folks in the margins or people who may not be able to access as well, we end up helping the whole. And um, you know, you have some examples here. Uh, the automatic doors is one I think of all the time. Every time I go to the grocery store. Uh, automatic doors help uh, people who are in wheelchairs or new, need some assistance, but they also help me when I'm pushing my cart full of groceries, carrying my daughter, uh, you know, forcing my son to stand next to me when he doesn't want to. Um, so I think, you know, text texting was invented for people who had um, uh, hearing impairments, and yet who doesn't use texting? So I just think it's a really important concept to help educators think about how when we do design for um, folks who would have a harder time accessing, we do end up helping the whole. We end up helping students in our classes that maybe haven't been uh, diagnosed or don't have a diagnosis, but are still there and can still benefit. So thanks, Melissa. Yeah, that's great. Um, we should note that her son is a teenager and that's why he doesn't want to stand <laughs> next to her. <laughs> Another metaphor that we sometimes use when we think about UDL is these metaphors of um, these people on uh, looking, trying to watch a soccer game, or in some cases, it's a baseball game. And in that first image, uh, you've probably seen these first two images at least. And so in the first image, this is an image of equity where everyone gets the same, the same support to be able to see the game. The second, or sorry, equality where everyone gets the same support. The second image is one of equity, where you get what you need to be able to see over that fence in order to see the game. And the last is what we think about when we think about UDL. So we, we um, make that fence so that you can see through it. We try to remove those barriers that, that are in the environment so that people can, so that they can see the game. There has been some debate back and forth sometimes around, around our professional learning team. Should we just take the fence out? Should we let the, the kids get in the game? And so there's, it's just an interesting conversation. Um, but so far what we've landed on in terms of leaving that fence there is that there are barriers in the world and we can't take down every barrier, but we're going to do our best to remove the barriers to the goal of seeing the game. The other thing that we uh, that you'll note about this particular image is that these boxes are piled up in the in this on the side, and they're piled up on the side because you will you we don't want you to take all of those accommodations away from students. So if a student needs a box or wants a box, they should be able to use that box to get over that chain link fence. However, they should also be available to everyone so that everyone can use them if they feel like they need it to see over that fence. So that brings us to our first core concept, which is the barrier is in the environment and not the learner. And when I think about this core concept, I wonder, Amanda, if there are any connections that you might be able to make to CTE and some of the CTE uh, experiences you've had around situations where the barrier was in the environment. Oh, you're muted. Yes, thank you, Melissa. So I um, I wanted to talk about one student. So I often think if I can tell a story about a student, then that can actually help everyone. So we had a student in Nashua, uh, Mateo, who was from Guatemala and um, in New Hampshire, where I was the CTE director, we had an automotive program, but you had to have certain prerequisites to get into that automotive program. You also couldn't be uh, a, a senior and get into the automotive program. So we had Mateo from Guatemala, ELL learner, did not have the requirements necessary, the, the pre-requirements, and was a senior uh, and was signif you know, significantly older than the other students. His um, ELL case manager came to see me. He was wanting to drop out of school, not feeling engaged. 
but he had taken small engine and the teacher had loved it and they had gotten along really well. So I met with Mateo and the auto teacher and we invited him to take auto one CTE and Mateo was incredibly successful. And what we didn't know is that he was actually, uh, had grown up working on large engines and had familiarity with automotive and that was the field he wanted to go into for his career. So what I wanted to talk about is the environment that we had created. Um, the teacher was nervous, you know, can I support him? I don't speak another language. And the environment itself of high school was not developed to really, um, was developed actually in a way that created barriers for Mateo to access and engage in school. Um, and through uh, applying some of the UDL principles, we were able to redesign the auto class. Very simply, it wasn't incredibly difficult. The teacher was on board. And now many more students have this opportunity. Uh, many more of our ELL students have this opportunity. So I think that the goal of this story is really to say like, we didn't even know we had these barriers, but they were there and they were real and they were impacting students' ability to engage. And um, by embracing UDL, we were able to engage more students. Great. And we, we wanted everybody to have an opportunity to sort of reflect on what resonates with them so far and what questions you have or how, what you think of so far what might work in your context. Um, you can go ahead and put those responses either on your desk, on a note or a notepad, or you can put them in the uh, questions box if you want to make them a little bit more public. Um, but I do really like that um, story, Amanda, and I wonder um, what were some of the the changes you made? Are there some like simple small changes that you made to that automotive class that you can tell folks about? Yeah, so um, it was really the, the teacher um, really looked at his curriculum and one of the things he did is we have a flexible, we had a flexible block or, um, you know, this homeroom, some schools have homerooms, and he invited Mateo every day to come during his homeroom and his flexible block and meet with him. And I think just that additional time was, was really supportive. We also found software um, that would allow us to translate some of the tool names. And uh, we found that we had some, we, we could use Google Translate. You know, it's just, it was really a mindset shift. Um, mm -hmm. One thing that we did end up doing is many CTE teachers are very concerned with safety. So over a summer project, <clears throat> we, got a, we invited a bunch of ELL students to, so, to work with us. And we did safety videos, both in Spanish and uh, in English that we uh, we did for automotive construction, HVAC, and then we posted those on YouTube and then the teachers could show those if they were concerned about safety because it kind of bubbled to the surface that the biggest concern for teachers was how will I keep these students safe and make sure everyone is safe in my room? And now we solved that problem and the goal was to have those in all the variety of 64 languages you know, that Nashua had. That's amazing. Great, thank you so much for that story. Um, so we'll move on to our second core concept, which comes from neuroscience. Um, so there's uh, this is what the old view of the brain was. We used to believe that the brain had some very discrete um, places that did specific functions. So this is where your your hunger comes from, and this is where your um, your planning is, and that sort of thing. So each place uh, had a specific function but what that set up is this as you see this artificial dichotomy of there being a normal brain and then an abnormal brain and that is no longer what we think about when we think about um, the brain what we do know from our neuroscience and learning sciences is that the brain is has incredible plasticity that it can grow and change and that it um, there is no average brain every brain is different like fingerprints so everybody's brain is as unique as their fingerprints. And so for our next activity, what we want to do to sort of explore this concept of variability is we want to give you an option. So we're trying to model UDL where we'll give you an option for perception. So you can stick with us and watch about 10 minutes of the myth of the average that we're going to watch together. And it's Todd Rose talking about um, what this variability means and how different each learner can be or you can stop and use your copy of the slides you can put us on mute and you can read one of these two articles and um, we'll come back in about 10 minutes so uh, just maybe set a little timer 
or check your clock and uh, come back to us around 2.35. So we'll give you a second to make that choice. Amanda? And I'm going to put the articles in the chat for everybody. Oh, yes. Great. Thank you. So you don't have to have the slides to, to do the articles because Amanda's going to put them in the chat. Thank you, Amanda. Okay, so we're going to... Um, we're going to watch a little bit of this. This is Todd Rose. He used to work for CAST. He's written several books since. Um, our founder of CAST is David Rose, and they have no relation, but they're both named Rose, so that's interesting. Um, but he's going to talk a little bit about the myth of the average, which is actually the name of one of his books. <laughs> Welcome to the TEDx Sonoma County stage, Todd Rose. It's 1952, and the Air Force has a problem. They've got good pilots flying better planes, but they're getting worse results, and they don't know why. And for a while, they blame the pilots. They even blame the technology. They eventually got around to blaming the flight instructors. But it turned out that the problem was actually with the cockpit. Let me explain. Imagine you're a fighter pilot. You're operating a machine that in some cases can travel faster than the speed of sound. And where issues between success and failure, sometimes life and death, can be measured in split seconds. If you're a fighter pilot, you know that your performance depends fundamentally on the fit between you and your cockpit. Because after all, what good is the best technology in the world if you can't reach the critical instruments when you need them the most? But this presents a challenge for the Air Force because obviously pilots are not the same size. So the issue is, how do you design one cockpit that can fit the most individuals? For a long time, it was assumed that you could do this by designing for the average pilot. That almost seems intuitively right. If you design something that fit for the average size person, wouldn't it fit most people? It seems right, but it's actually wrong. And 60 years ago, an Air Force researcher, Gilbert Daniels, proved to the world just how wrong this really is and what it was costing us. Here's how he did it. He studied over 4,000 pilots. And he measured them on 10 dimensions of size. And he asked a very simple question. How many of these pilots are average on all 10 dimensions? The assumption was that most of them would be. Do you know how many really were? Zero. Gilbert Daniels proved there was no such thing as an average pilot. Instead, what he found was that every single pilot had what we call a jagged size profile, right? Means not, it means means you're not, no one's at the same on every dimension. Now, this makes sense. Just because you're the tallest person doesn't mean you're the heaviest. Doesn't mean you have the broadest shoulders or the longest torso. But this is tricky because if every pilot has a jagged size profile and you design a cockpit on average, you've literally designed it for nobody. So the Air Force realized they had a problem. And their response was bold. They banned the average. Meaning that moving forward, they refused to buy fighter jets where the cockpit was designed for an average sized pilot. And instead, they demanded that the companies who built these planes design them to the edges of dimensions of size. Meaning that rather than design for say the average height, 
they wanted a cockpit that could accommodate as close to the shortest pilot and the tallest pilot as the technology would allow. Now, the companies that made these planes, as you could imagine, weren't happy. Right? They argued and lobbied and they said, it's gonna be impossible or at least impossibly expensive to build a flexible cockpit. But once they realized that the Air Force wasn't going to budge, suddenly it was possible. And it turned out it wasn't that expensive. And in fact, they made great strides, leveraging simple solutions that we all take for granted in our everyday lives, like adjustable seats. And as a result, the Air Force not only improved the performance of the pilots that they already had, but they dramatically expanded their talent pool. And today, we have the most diverse pool of fighter pilots ever. But here's the thing, many of our top pilots would have never fit in a cockpit designed on average. So most of us have never sat in the cockpit of a $150 million fighter jet, right? But we've all sat in the classroom. And I would argue, I, was, I would argue that these are the cockpits of our economy. And I think we all know that we have some problems. We're spending more money than ever before, but we're getting worse results. Whether we're talking about declining test scores in math and science or our dropout crisis, you probably know that we have over 1.2 million dropouts every single year in high school in this country. What you may not know is that at least 4% of those dropouts are known to be intellectually gifted. That means we're losing over 50,000 of our brightest minds every single year. So we know we have a problem, but do we know why? So far, we've been content to blame the students. We blame the teachers. We even blame the parents. But here's the thing. I think back to the Air Force example, and I can't help but wonder how much of this problem is just bad design. Here's what I mean. Even though we have one of the most diverse countries in the history of the world, and even though it's the 21st century, we still design our learning environments like textbooks for the average student. No kidding. We call it age appropriate and we think it's good enough, but of course it's not. I mean, think about it. What does it even mean to design for an average student? Because a student is not one dimensional, like struggling to gifted, Students vary on many dimensions of learning, just like they vary on dimensions of size. Here are a few obvious ones. And just like size, each student, every single one of them, has a jagged learning profile, meaning they have strengths, they're average at some things, and they have weaknesses. We all do. Even geniuses have weaknesses. But if the fighter pilot example has taught us anything, it's this. If you design those learning environments on average, odds are you designed them for nobody. So we'll stop there um, so that we can remain on time. But uh, we were wondering if you would mind putting in the, in the chat, what resonated for you um, so far around this concept of variability and designing on average and how that um how what's your experience with that do you have any um examples to share from cte for us amanda um i do but i also wanted to say we're getting great responses in the chat folks have um, been sharing that the video reminds them of that uh a couple of stories so jason shared the pepsi story where they tried to find the fl perfect flavor of pepsi and 
there is no perfect flavor for everyone. You know, people have different variations that they like. And then uh, another uh, individual in the chat shared that idea about the myth of the seatbelt. So, you know, that there's, uh, by designing the seatbelt that could fit everyone, actually they found that the seatbelt uh, is not designed well often for women, uh, for people who have different body shapes, heights, it doesn't protect them as well. So by designing the seatbelt for that uh, average person, you're actually leaving quite a few people unsafe. <laughs> so yeah. yeah, so I think people, the video seems to be really resonating with people, so. Great, great. Um, and if you wanna continue to watch the video, there's um, much more, much more to it. He goes into um, talking about uh, more into classrooms and curriculum and books and that sort of thing. So feel free to watch that at your uh, when you have some extra time. Another thing that we uh, another metaphor we use to sort of talk about this concept of variability is a dinner party analogy. So um, on your screen you'll see a Mexican lasagna and I'd like you to imagine that I have designed this Mexican lasagna for a dinner party that I'm going to invite you and all of your friends to. And when you see you have this uh, Mexican lasagna, you'll see there's cheese. I've, I've prepared all of the food groups, right? So there's cheese, there's vegetables, there's beans, there's meat, there's um, carbs, all those things in one. So in my mind, I've got this great Mexican lasagna that like needs all of these things. And I, um, so I decide I don't even need side dishes because everything nutritious is in this, in this Mexican lasagna. And then I decide I'm going to invite Amanda and all her friends to to a party at my house, and this is what we're going to eat. And my goal is for everyone to be fed and happy. And so, can you um, think through your friends, uh, Amanda and your family, and tell me is there anybody that's not going to be able to eat my Mexican lasagna? Well, yep. Yeah. So my brother is lactose intolerant, so he's not going to do well with the cheese. Um, my sister is a vegetarian, so we would need to remove the meat for her. Um, uh, my husband is carb friendly off and on, depending on how he feels about his body at that, <laughs> at that moment. Um, so, you know, you could catch him on an off day. And um, also my son, uh, Anthony, just doesn't like onions. So, you know, we would just have to think about that. Have to take those onions out of that meat. Yeah. So I could... Theoretically, I could make a meat-free lasagna, a vegetarian lasagna. A, um, I could make the lasagna with the zucchini noodles for your husband so he doesn't have to eat the carbs. I could take the onions out of the meat mixture and I could find some sort of cheese alternative. Um, but at this point, I, you, you named like five people and I've already made five lasagna. So that's a, a lot of lasagna. So instead, what... I might do is I might build a burrito bar so that people could come up and they could um, choose what will work for them at that moment and choose what is going to help them meet that goal of being fed and happy. So this is um, what we're, when we think about lesson design, this is kind of what we, instead of, instead of having five lasagnas or five lesson designs, we, we design these flexible lessons where people can choose and take what's gonna work for them in that moment to meet that goal. Sometimes we get a question about that. Um, sometimes I will tell the story of my, my nephew, Evan, who on his fifth birthday, someone asked him what his favorite food was and he said, pretty much cheese, because that's all he was eating is cheese, meat and cheese. You do a burrito bar and Evan will just take the meat and cheese if left to his own devices. And so people will ask that question about students. What if students are just choosing the same thing or things that, that might not be good for them in that moment. And that's when we talk about the teacher as a coach to help kind of push students towards things that are going to um, advance their learnings while still giving them options. Another um, thing we like to kind of point to when we talk about options is that choice is not the same as variety. So giving someone a choice of how to build their, their route to a goal is not the same as um, doing it one way this day and another way the second day. So we're going to read on Monday and we're going to we're going to listen on Tuesday. And it, we use the metaphor of a school uh, cafeteria plan. So if you don't like pizza, you're not going to eat on Monday. So that is variety, where you have one thing on Monday, one thing on Tuesday. Whereas choice, 
is this opportunity to sort of build your own um, route to your goal. Melissa, can I say, just jump in one sec. We had a comment yes. um, from a, a, an educator who said, you know, I love this, but um, I can hear my faculty sort of like pushing back. Oh, how are we gonna do, this seems like so much work. You know, we have to design all this choice. And I just wanted to say, um, you know, we will get to that throughout the various webinars, but I just wanted to address that because I, I feel like a lot of people might be thinking that right now. Um, when I brought this to Nashua, you know, I had that fear to my, and when I was CTE director, I brought it to the educators, but the opposite was true. And what ended up happening is the teach, because the framework, which Melissa will get into, has so much choice built into it, uh, teachers are really able to, it's not prescriptive, so teachers can really try a few of the UDL um, principles. So I, I just, it just felt like it was really important to kind of address that because people might be feeling it. I don't know what your, you know, response might be. <clears throat> yeah, and um, usually our response is, first of all, start small because small changes make a big difference. Maybe just one, one choice in a lesson um, makes a big difference. Um, secondly, people start to get like sort of their rhythm with UDL as they start to experience it more. And so sometimes they they build in sort of a write, a speak, or a draw option into every lesson. So it can be kind of a routine. Other things that they do is they set up their learning environment so that the same choices kind of exist within the learning environment. For example, self-regulation. So you can sit in the soft chair, you can sit at the table, or you can sit with the teacher might be the choice every day, so kids kind of get used to it. So there's some systems that you can build in for these choices that um, once they're set up, then hopefully it will be less work. Uh, another thing that we want to say about variability is that um, not only is every brain different, but every brain every day is different. So we, Amanda and I attended a, a a staff meeting this morning where someone was talking about how your brain changes depending on what you're doing every single day and so um, one of our neuroscientists was talking about that um, in addition it depends on what context you're in as to what uh, what you might need on any given day and so we use this activity called north south east west to sort of um, illustrate this point so uh, if you find your chat boxes, we want you to just kind of look at these really quickly and decide which of these personalities would you say that you are. So a North person likes to plunge in and try things. An East person likes to look at the big picture, all the possibilities kind of before they get to the details. Whereas a per the West person wants to know who, what, where, why before acting. And then someone who is a South person wants to consider everyone's feelings, hear all the voices before they decide what the, the route is. So do you uh, know which one of these you are, Amanda? Very much North. <laughs> very much North. I think I'm very much South, so we're on opposite poles. So consider who you are in general, and then consider if you're in a grocery, sh grocery shopping in a market that you know well. Are you plunging in? Are you looking at the big picture? Are you considering feelings? Or are you paying attention to detail? And when I'm grocery shopping, I might be looking at the big picture actually, because I want to have some things that I can use in more than one way. So I might be looking at like the, the larger idea, like I need some meat, I need some vegetables, sort of larger. How about you, Amanda, when you're grocery shopping? Oh, I, so I like to just get it done. So my thing is like, go in, is. Just get everything done as fast as possible. I don't like to bring my family with me. I love my family. I just want to say that I'm using them in some very negative examples today. But um, maybe it's COVID-19. But um, I usually just, you know, won't just want to plunge in. Boom, get it done. Get out. I have other things to do. Nice. So how about if you are planning a party for your best friend's birthday? Are you like Oprah where the, the, the love is in the details? Oprah says the love is in the details. No, I don't even wrap presents. People know that. I, <laughs> I give it to them in the bag. I'm like, here, it's very thoughtful. I, I like to give them the gift that you know, I really think they want, but I really don't yeah. feel like I'm to, you know, my husband, he does the lines and the bows and it's beautiful. And I'm like, here mm -hmm. you go. That's a gift. <laughs> so he's in charge of the wrapping at your house. Yes. Yeah. 
So for a party, I might be more likely to pay attention to detail, make sure I got all of the invites, um, all of those things. I might be more likely to do that if I'm thinking about a party. Melissa, that actually brings up a good point. Some people are saying I'm South, I'm North, I'm what, you know, so it's different roles in different situations, right? Right. Okay. Yes, and sometimes um, I use, when we talk about the Mexican lasagna story, um, sometimes even whether or not you would eat that Mexican lasagna is contextual. So not a lot of people want to be eating red sauce if they're at a professional event. Like what if I'm wearing a like a white suit, I'm not going to necessarily want to eat that red sauce, but by myself, I might do fine with the Mexican lasagna and I don't care how, how messy it is because I'm at home by myself. So, um, and the last scenario we talk about is on someone on a committee deciding which curriculum to purchase. And this is usually when people go almost completely, everyone moves at this one because it's kind of a different activity. It's not in the personal life, it's not in the professional zone and um, everybody moves and gets to a different spot. So we do this activity to sort of demonstrate that it depends on what's going on for you or what the, the activity is as to what choice you might make or what might be best for you. And so that's why we design these flexible lessons that are open. I have a colleague that likes to listen to nonfiction books to get the information but he wants to read a fiction book because he wants to kind of pace it himself. He wants to read faster when he's excited or slow it down when he's super interested. So um, so no, not only are our brains unique and every person's brain's different, but we are variable as individuals ourselves depending on what context we're in. So that's our second core concept, which is variability is the norm um, and it's not the exception. So can you think of any CTE examples that you want to bring up around variability, Amanda? I also wanted to say, I just put the Ted Rose uh, video in the chat so that folks have that if they want to go back. Sorry, it's like people are chatting so much. It's awesome. That's great. Uh, so I'm trying to do like you know, both of those things as, at, at once. So. So variability in um, in CTE. Well, you know, in CTE, I always think of our um, special population students, and there's a lot of variability built into those uh, special populations. Um, Melissa, you worked with us in Nashua, so you were familiar with, um, you know, what what I'm speaking about the special populations. Should I define that here for folks? Sure. Yeah. Okay, great. So you know, look, thinking about um, so Perkins Five, the legislative uh, legislation for CTE that provides funding and kind of direction um, decided that we really need to make sure that we have access for females in traditionally male classes, males in traditionally female classes, that we have access and opportunity for English language learners, for homeless students, now for uh, students whose parents are in the military. So when I think about variability, you know, the students themselves are just coming from these very diverse backgrounds and a female student in an automotive class might need some different kinds of supports than you know, the, the traditional male automotive student. Um, so I don't know if you want to reflect back on that, Melissa. Yeah. Um, yeah, and that's what I find interesting about that is that uh, open and flexible design that you're doing in Nashua uh, helps different types of students get involved. And it brings me back to the pilot example. So um, different kinds of people could become pilots once the cockpit was flexible enough. And, and it's women in particular that you're bringing up is um, more women were able to become pilots because the cockpit was more flexible. So in our um, design, designing things for flexibility, we're also designing them for equity. Yeah, that's great. And then the other thing I was thinking about was um, work-based learning is a big piece of CTE and uh and internships you can think if you're not a current technical education teacher internships um and so often there's a lot of barriers to that for students so you know in many cases they would need a car to get to their internship or work-based learning site um and so when you're designing to help support those students maybe um i know some centers have a bus so in nashville we had a bus that anyone could get on so a student could take their car if they wanted or they could get on this bus, which would deliver them to the auto loop where there was a large number of auto dealerships that they could participate their work-based learning site. Some students 
want, you know, there, I know centers have used Uber before. I know some centers have purchased vans where the teacher actually gets their special driver's license and drives the students around to the internships. I think the big takeaway from that for UDL is offer all the, the options to all the students because one day a student may not want to, you know, they might not have gas in their car. So even though they have a car, they don't want to drive it on that day, <clears throat> they have an option. Um, maybe, you know, so that's kind of another place my brain goes with CTE. Great. All right, so we're heading into our last concept, last core concept, which is um, comes from the learning sciences, and that's where our UDL guidelines come in. So our last core concept is variability is predictable in learning and can be designed for. So this is sort of that answer to how can I design for all of my 30 kids in my classroom because they're all so variable. You're telling me each has a unique brain, so how can I design for it? So the good news is is that neuroscience and learning science will tell us that although there is no average brain, that um, there are some very some networks that we can design for and some specific ways in which variability sort of fits into the brain. So when you think about the brain as like your fist, this um, middle part of the brain is what we call the affective network and that monitors our emotions and our feelings and it's where our interest lies. And we call it the why of learning. Why do I want to learn this? And then um, if this is your brainstem, the back of your brain is the perception area. And it's what we call the recognition network. It's when you take where you take in information and turn it into usable knowledge. And then the front of the brain is the strategic network. And it is um, where you make plans and you do strategy. And that's how you act on your learning. So in the back of the brain, it's taking in the information. And the front of the brain is how am I going to act on it? And so that's how we organized our UDL guidelines. And on this slide 38, you'll be able to um, explore on your own. There's a PDF version of the guidelines. I also think that we have it in the handouts, maybe a PDF version of the guidelines. Yeah, we have all of these in the handouts. Mostly. Great. Great. And then there's that online interactive version that you can kind of explore on your own if you'd like to. Um, so I, sometimes we find it useful to describe to people how these guidelines came about. And so you, uh, CAST did the research in the learning sciences. We looked to neuropsychology, neuroscience, cognitive neuroscience, and other sciences. And the first question they asked was, what is the range and source of human variability in learning? So how big is this human variability? And that's where they came up with those three principles that they this variability kind of goes along these three lines. It goes along, how do I engage in learning? How do I perceive? How do I take in knowledge? And how do I act upon my understanding? So those are the main three areas. And that's where we get these three guide, these three um, principles, we call them, or we call them networks. And that's where that comes from. And there's like four of these same slides. Here we go. <laughs> Somehow it got duplicated four times. Um, so again, as I said, the, the effective network is how will learners engage, representation, how will they perceive and comprehend, and action expression is how will they act on their understanding. So once we get to that, then the researchers asked, what are the design components that, that a learning designer should consider when we're addressing variability in each of these networks? And that's where we come up with these nine guidelines, and those are the boxes that you'll see here. So for example, this first box is recruiting interest. So one thing you wanna think about when you're thinking about engaging learners is how do I get them interested in the content? And then how do I help them sustain their effort and persistence? So those are the things that you wanna think about when you're addressing variability um, in your learners. And then the last question that they ask themselves is what are specific practices or strategies that learning designers or teachers can use to reduce barriers to learning in each of these principles. So that's where we come up with these little bullets, these little checkpoints, we call them. Um, but we, they're not, a, it's not a checklist. So I wanna make sure that we understand it's not a checklist, but we call them checkpoints, just things to think about. So under recruiting interest, for example, if I'm trying to think about recruiting interest, maybe I could go to this first bullet, which is optimize individual choice and autonomy. So maybe I can give my learners a choice of topic if I'm trying to help them research a paper and that might help engage 
their interest a little bit more. So that is, we're gonna teach you um, next webinar more about how do we use these guidelines when we're interacting with the learning design, um, because we want you to, to know that you don't have to go down each of the checkpoints. Every checkpoint doesn't have to be in every lesson. Well, we'll talk about how to use them, but we just wanted you to know in this first webinar how it's set up. So it's set up with these three brain networks, the nine guidelines are the design components, and the 31 checkpoints are the specific practices. And also, not only is it, is it organized in the columns, so up and down, but it's also organized across. So this first row, this access row, is where we go to when our learner needs access to the material. So in perception, it says offer alternatives for auditory information. So don't only have, a, have something for them to listen to, but maybe also something for them to read. And then what do we want to think about? How are our learners going to build understanding? Then we'll go to this build row. And if we look under language and symbols, so maybe we're going to help students by clarifying vocabulary and symbols uh, to help them build their understanding. And then this final row is skills and practices that we're helping students learn that hopefully they can transfer into many different areas. So we're helping them to enhance their capacity for monitoring progress. And they can use that not only in this learning design, but in future learning design. So that's where the learner develops that agency to have those skills and practices. And then the final row is the goal of universal design for learning. And that is helping learners become expert learners, helping them learn how to learn as they learn what they should be learning. And so our expert learners, and we'll talk a little bit more about this in our next webinar, are learners who are purposeful and motivated, resourceful and knowledgeable and strategic and goal directed. And we want you again, as I said, we want you to know that it's UDL is not a checklist. It's in, you're going to infuse the things that you need based on your goals and the barriers you anticipate to the goals. And we'll talk more about that next time. And teaching students how to learn, not just what to learn. And as we say, individuals, individuals vary on contact on depending on the context, so does how you're going to use UDL. That's going to vary depending on the context. And um, as we said earlier, huge, small changes make a huge difference. So I'm going to put back up our definition of universal design for learning and uh, let you think about that and maybe respond in the chat as you reflect. Um, is there any final things? We have about three minutes left. Are there any final things you might want to say or let us know what's going on in the chat, Amanda? Um, just a lot of people really resonating with the um, idea that there is no uh, average and that when we design for the average, we really do a disservice to all, to all the students. Mm -hmm. um, and um, I have put a free the free book on UDL in the chat. I've also added um, the bit.ly was in the chat. Hopefully you can st still view that. Um, so just trying to get all of our resources in the chat, but you know, we'll be putting this to pra into practice on Friday. So, so it's <laughs> great. And then um, we'll learn, we did have some folks ask, how do we do this in a virtual environment? So I reminded them that the third webinar will take that into account and then CTE on the 15th. And the last thing is I have been sharing the UDL on campus uh, mm -hmm. um, resource, which is a great resource for the adjunct faculty that are here who might have more questions, want to investigate UDL more. Great. Yes, and it's also in the slide deck, the, the UDL Theory and Practice, and it is a free digital book. It also has some options for it to read to you. Um, and then the other thing that we um, wanted to, just the final slide, is CAS does professional learning customized depending on your context. So if you're interested in what that might look like for your school, um, you can contact Maddie and she'll let you know. Um, and I don't know, some folks are asking if these webinars are recorded, um, you know, and then they can access them later. I'm not, I think you should reach out to the creators of the, this, you know, the organizers of this and, and they'll be able to get you copies. I can address that. Okay, great. Awesome. <laughs> Thanks, Amy. Um, yes, so everything is being recorded. They will be up on our website. I will send out a link to everyone who is registered for this event with all the resources that Amanda and Melissa have posted in the chat box, um, all the handouts again, so you have that information. And um, as I said at the beginning of the webinar, they will be posted not for 
ever but for a short time um, so be sure you get on there and check those things out but share this information out and if there's somebody in your network or in your school that you would like to see um, on these webinars or that you'd like think could benefit from this information please share it out because we are excited to get universal design for learning really building that capacity of knowledge within the state of Illinois. That's our goal through doing this series. So thank you both so much. And yes, we'll be um, in touch via email. And again, Friday, we're all back together again. And I hope everybody can come back on and join us. Yeah, right. Awesome. I'm, I'm sharing the bit.ly one more time because folks were asking about the slide deck. So yes. Well, thank you so much. I hope we'll see you all on Friday. Great, thank you both very much. Any closing comments, Amanda? No, I, I'm so excited. Folks are wanting to talk about <laughs> CTE, so I'm like, <laughs> This is your crowd, yes, CTE. Thank you also very much, everyone. Be safe, be healthy, stay positive, and we'll look forward to seeing you all on Friday. Thank you. Thank you.